Harvey Goldstein. I'm originally from Middletown, born and raised there, went to local schools, Woodrow Wilson High School. It would have been October of 68. And um, I had finished already three years of college at Quinnipiac. Um, I was asked to take a semester off because I had a bad semester in my sophomore year, caught up with me at the end of my junior year. So they had, uh, I had to take a semester. She knew what was going to happen as soon as she did. She waited till the fall semester when she was really pushed for the names. And um, so in October, I got notified for my physical. Actually, what happened first was I received a letter with no stamp. And those of you that remember those days, I didn't know anybody that owned a post office, so I knew if something was amiss. So I opened it up. It was that old thing, greetings. This is before lottery. So I got my notice for physical in October. By early November, I had my draft notice to report for the Army. I wasn't a big fan of guns. I'm still not a big fan of guns. So I had talked to uh, the Air Force recruiter at some point after the physical and um, thought, well, maybe. Um, once I got the actual notice to report, good old mom said, why don't you call the Air Force recruiter? I said, okay. So I True story, I pick up the phone and he was already there because I knew when the notices went out. I never had to dial. Can I still get into the Air Force? Of course you can, Harvey, not a problem. So the day before Thanksgiving of 1968, I went, I, I went to New Haven. Um, they took us over to uh, Tweed International. You're familiar with the airport. It has, one, it has two gates, which is really funny because there's only one plane. Um, we flew from Tweed to uh, Newark, and then out to a, uh, that was on a Eastern Whisper Jet. I don't know if anybody remembers the old time planes. And then, we're talking about old planes, they put us on a, in Newark on a Braniff jet uh, to fly down to San Antonio. We arrived late at night, the day before Thanksgiving. First day of basic training was Thanksgiving Day, 1968. Went through the whole um, uh, basic training like every, well actually my basic training was different than most others. Um, shortly after I arrived, and within a couple of days actually, we had already gotten our shots, and a couple of recruits had died, and they weren't sure from what, but they thought it was a combination of the inoculations, which might have been a bad serum, with overexertion. We could not double time. We had to walk every place. We couldn't run the mile. We couldn't do any heavy calisthenics. We had the easiest basic trick. Pledging a fraternity in college was more difficult than basic <laughs> training. Um, so I endured all of, the, all of that. While in basic training, like all of the rest of us, you go through a battery of tests um, to see what you're qualified for, whether you're a mechanic, whether you're this, whether you're that. They gave us a, uh, a test for a made up, it was a made up language. And then we had to answer questions. Well, I was one of those that scored very high. Languages have always come easy to me. So I scored very high, supposedly one of the highest. That remains to be seen. They gave us a choice of languages. And I said, well, okay, here we are. It's 19, by this time it's 1969. And uh, I said, um, it was January of 69. I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, so I'm going to select Russian as my language because I figured that would be a good one to learn for maybe some kind of international business once my time in the Air Force is over. My second choice was Mandarin Chinese because at that time we didn't recognize Red China, but I thought at some point we're going to have to recognize 8 billion people. So that was my second choice. My third, fourth, and fifth choices were like Eastern European uh, languages, and I really don't remember what they were. When the orders came down, when we actually got our assignments, it read North Vietnamese. Uh, that wasn't on the list, but that's what I got. So we left San Antonio. Um, I spent an extra three weeks after basic training down there, what they called casual, until orders came down. And then went up initially to Fort Myer. Um, our language school was in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, we were at Fort Myer. Has anybody within the last 50 years, 40 years anyway, been to um, Arlington National Cemetery. 
Okay, you know where the visitor center is and where the big parking lot is? And that's where our barracks were. We got there and we were told that the barracks were condemned. They were coming down within a few weeks. We were there for about three weeks and then they moved all of the Air Force. The Army stayed, obviously, they moved them to the other side. But they moved all of the Air Force over to Andrews Air Force Base. And we would take a bus five days a week, Monday through Friday, from Andrews Air Force Base into Arlington, Virginia, actually Roslyn, for our classes. We started with 20, we wound up with 19 in the language school. They split us up into two groups. This was my class. Some of the guys I'm still close with, um, we still connect. One of my really good friends was in our sister class, and he's, this was one of our teachers. Uh, we spent nine months learning basically conversational North Vietnamese. And North Vietnamese is different from South Vietnamese in the dialect. Um, written, it's exactly the same. But in speaking it, uh, North Vietnamese is considered the proper. It's kind of like, I don't want to offend any Southerners here, but it's like in the South here where they drawl. Same thing is true in, um, in, in Vietnamese. The North was kind of a proper clipped, and in the South they kind of draw it. Something simple like, uh, there's a dessert, um, it's an appetizer actually that I really like, and it's called, in North, Viet North Vietnamese it's called chizo. And it's like a spring roll, it's, it's, it's fried, it's got like pork and other veggies inside of it. In South Vietnamese, it's choyo. So it's a slight derivation, but if I were to say choyo to a South Vietnamese, and I've done this, they look at me like I have, they have no idea what I'm saying. So there's a slight difference. Other interesting thing about Vietnamese is that it's, all, it's, it's monosyllabic and uh, it's all diacritical marks. So depending on how you say something, will change the meaning. Two, two words, toy, ban, T-O-I with a little, like a hat over the O, and ban, which could have any number of different marks depending on how you say it. Could either mean, I am your friend, or it could mean, I am going to shoot you. So you had to be careful on how you say it. These were two of our teachers, their sisters, Ko Bik and Ko Kim Chi. Uh, I think their last name was Go. It was hard to study because they were very pretty. So I was what, 22, and I was one of the older guys, and they were probably uh, 19, 20 years old. Um, we found that most of the Vietnamese women that were our teachers, some of them were older, but they were all very attractive, very nice, very pleasant. We learned a lot. We, one of the things that we learned that was interesting was that when we would talk, not we usually talk about politics, but there was one teacher, Bang An, who um, had been a teacher, had been a singer rather, in Hanoi. And again, all of our teachers were from the North, or their families were from the North. And they came south in 54 and then eventually to the United States. Um, we had one teacher who, at least one, that loved Ho Chi Minh. She didn't like what happened to her country, she didn't like what happened to Vietnam, but Ho Chi Minh, was a nationalist. He, he believed in his country. He, initially, he wasn't a communist. He kind of was forced into it when the United States didn't give him the support that he asked for way back in 49, I guess it was, with Truman. Um, and he eventually turned to the Russians and the Chinese. But they loved him. They called him Bak Ho, Uncle Ho. Um, so it was interesting with that. After Andrews, we went down to um, San Angelo, Texas. And we had uh, another six months of schooling. And this was radio school. This is where we would live, listen to uh, tape transmissions of actual intercepts, uh, which is what we were being trained for. So a lot of it was from MIGs to other MIGs. It might have been ground site to MIGs or MIGs to ground site. And we were listening and transcribing and getting used to what we would be doing in the real world once we got overseas. Uh, we did this for six months. We then also went to survival schools. And my first survival school was funny. We were going to Vietnam. Most of the guys went to the state of Washington where it was snowy and climbed the mountains in February. Um, I would have gone with them, but I had been in a car accident. So I went in May, May of 1970. Um, went through survival school, climbed mountains. One of the things that they did when we first arrived when we started out on our trek was they gave me a rabbit to take care of. Wasn't sure why, but they gave me the rabbit. We bonded, I fed him, I petted him. He was a nice rabbit. Um, we climbed mountains, we uh, made uh, 
uh, jerky. They gave us some raw beef. We made jerky. Um, and then uh, I guess it was the second or third night out, they were going to teach us how to kill and skin game so that you could eat it. So they wanted me to kill the rabbit that we were going to eat. I'm not killing the rabbit. He's my friend. <laughs> so they ordered, they told me a couple of times, finally it was a major who was in charge and he gave me an order. I said, you can court-martial me. I don't care. He, I've been taking care of him for three days. I'm not killing him. They told me that if I didn't kill him, I couldn't eat him. Fine. I'm not planning on eating him. Um, so they, they all had a, a rabbit dinner. It wasn't much of them. He wasn't a big rabbit. Um, and uh, I ate a, so I had a pemmican bar for, for dinner that night. The next part of survival school was a POW situation. So at midnight, this was around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, they sent us out at night for an obstacle course. And we did this whole obstacle course. And when you got to the end of the obstacle course, as you go under the barbed wire, there, is, uh, there were guys with hats with red stars on them screaming at us, Yankee dogs, and we were captured. We were POWs, and we did that for the next 72 hours. We were in isolation, we were interrogated. Um, we weren't physically beaten, but we were you know, pretty much abused verbally. It was here that I found out about Kent State. They took me off for an interrogation and they threw a newspaper in front of me and they said, this is what your American soldiers do. They kill college students. And I looked at it and I said, that's crap, you know, this isn't real. And they, they broke from their roles in the academic situation to explain to me that, yes, this is real, this happened yesterday, this is today's newspaper, this happened yesterday. It was kind of shocking to, to, find, out, to find out that this happened, especially to find out about it that way. I was um, going into the service, I was pretty much anti-Vietnam War, while I was there I was, um, and I got involved with organizations and even started a few. Um, but it was interesting to find out in that manner what had happened. When we went overseas, our orders when we were in, um, when we got our orders in April of 70, our orders for all of us went for Okinawa. We were going to go to Okinawa, Kadena Air Base, and we were going to be flying large birds, uh, the 135s, which were um, configured for espionage. We were going to fly over Russia, China, North Korea, and North Vietnam, and I'm not sure, I think that was just the four countries. And there were linguists to cover all languages, and we would take turns sitting the positions. Um, they were 24-hour missions, 20 to 24-hour missions. They would refuel in the air. Um, it was called Combat Apple. So this was in April of 70 when I got my orders. I went through two survival schools, the one I told you about in Washington, another survival school back in Texas for water survival. Um, then was home for 30 days. And finally made it to Okinawa. I left the States on July 3rd, 1970, and because of the dateline, landed in Okinawa uh, on July 5th, 1970. As I walked across the tarmac, one of my friends, never forget it, yelled to me, Harv, don't unpack, you're going south. And I never heard that expression before, but I knew what he meant. They had changed, we got our orders like early to middle early April, actually, in 1970. Within two weeks, they had changed the orders to Vietnam. They never told any of us. There were 20, 20 of us. And some of the guys were married. They had already started shipping clo um, uh, furniture over. They were going to be getting apartments because their wives were going to, going to be joining them. They now had to start shipping everything back. Some of the single guys did volunteer to take the places of the married guys um, so that the married guys could stay in Okinawa. Um, so again, these were longer missions. Because my orders read for now, when I, once I got there and found out they had been changed for Vietnam, I had no clearance. I had a top secret crypto clearance. I had about the highest you could get because of what we were going to be working with. So we were there on Okinawa for three weeks and we couldn't do anything. We couldn't go out to ops. We couldn't fly. We, it was the 6990th security squadron and we could have no part of it. So basically, we hung around the squadron. I'm a little surprised they didn't give us menial work to do, but they never even did that. Um, so we spent three weeks just hanging out and doing a lot of drinking. You know, gin at that time on the air base was 95 cents a gallon, but the rule was you couldn't buy more than two gallons a day per person. Um, the mixer was more expensive. 
Um, and we use it. We, we, we used it. Um, finally made it to Vietnam the end of July. And before I could actually fly any missions, because I had been, now I wasn't a pilot, but because I had been knocked out in, uh, uh, in Texas, I had to go through a, um, uh, and I had, had to have a, an EEG uh, in order to fly. I'm thinking, I'm not piloting the plane, I'm not sure why, but okay, so they sent me up to camera. I want to backtrack just a bit. We had, because of the change in the orders, uh, when we were in, still in Okinawa, that's why this is up here now, um, we were all pretty well fed up. We've been following the rules, doing what we were supposed to do, playing by their rules, and now they're changing it on us. They're telling, they're, without notification, they've changed the orders on us. They had plenty of time to notify us. Um, so we're in the, the Kadena Airport, seeing one of our friends off, because they were sending us by twos and threes, rarely anybody by themselves, but twos and threes from Kadena down to Vietnam. And one night, we're sitting there waiting for the uh, one of our friends to go, and um, he says, you know what the Air Force does? They treat us the lowest, what's the lowest of the low? That's how they're treating us. We're worms. We're nothing but worms to them. That's what they step on, they squish them, which is what this comes from. So we became the worms, which uh, while there we came up with the acronym of we openly resist military stupidity <laughs> and uh, uh, because we had just basically had it so it was interesting once we got to Vietnam uh, at one point we had patches made for our hats um, which at first we were a joke and then we'd be you know to the to the senior NCOs and then we became a thorn in their side and at one point the first shirt came up to me first sergeant came up to me and said uh, you know that's not government issue and you have to remove that from your cap and I said, Sergeant, you are 100% right, and I will. But what you have to do also is that American flag on the back of your cap is that government issue, and you have to remove that from yours. <laughs> and he looked at me, shrugged his shoulders, and he never bothered me again. But this is a view from our barracks. That's the in-country terminal at the end of the road. So this is shooting up the street. This is yours truly getting ready for a mission. That's, you? Uh, that's me. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with airplanes. We flew in DC 3s, Goonie Birds, C 47s. They were configured for, um, for espionage. We were listeners. We were listening for North Vietnamese voice communications in South Vietnam. So it's a difference, again, between North and South Vietnamese. Um, also flew a lot in Cambodia. Most of well, my missions were either one of two places, generally speaking. We were either down in the Delta or we were over in Cambodia and spent a lot of time in Cambodia flying over Kampong Sam, Kampong Cham. I have some pictures of Nam Pen. Flying out of Saigon, we didn't have a back door. We had some straps. Um, our detachments in Da Nang and NKP Thailand had back doors, but we did not. Now, it's a non-pressurized plane, not supposed to fly over 10,000 feet. In Vietnam, we usually flew between five to 8,000 feet and listened in to what was happening. Veterans, okay, this is Antique Airlines. They were the ones that were our, they were our chauffeurs, basically. These were the pilots. It was a different squadron, um, but they were our pilots and navigators, and we would fly with them. Goody Burke's twin-engine prop plane. This is a Goody Burke. It's a twin-engine prop plane. Now, this was 1970. I was there 70 to 71. Some of the planes actually predated World War II and flew the Burma Hump, I think in the late 30s. Um, they were good planes. We were told that if we were to lose both engines, uh, we could still easily fly glide a good 25 miles to, safe, to find a place to safely touch down. It was a great plane. It was a noisy plane, but it was a good plane. I still have a, 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 a love for this aircraft. I did a TDY, I did a temporary uh, assignment to uh, Thailand, the Kham Phanam, NKP. While there, we flew over Laos. That was not so healthy, and I'll tell you that in a second. Um, but when I left there, I was going back to Saigon, back to Tan Son Yu, and I'd always wanted to fly in a scatback, because to me, the scatbacks were those little weird jets I said, oh, that would be so cool. So we had actual tickets on a American Airlines or whatever airlines it was to go from um, uh, Bangkok back down to Saigon. 
And I, but we had the option to take the scat back. I said, well, let's do that. I was with a friend. I said, let's take the scat back. So we did. We turned in our commercial tickets for the scat back. Lo and behold, the scat back was a Goonie bird. So what should have been about a two hour flight, maybe at the most, because of plane trouble where we had a touchdown someplace, there was like a nine hour journey from Bangkok to Saigon. It was not fun. Actually, nothing. I was just just passed through. I, uh, I wasn't. I probably wasn't there more than a couple of hours. Yeah. I was in. I guess I was in Thailand for about 45 days, um, up in the Kham Phanam, which is like in the. If you if you look at Thailand in the northeast corner, there's like a little bump into the Mekong River, right by Laos, and that little bump is where NKP was. NKP, we flew over Laos, and Laos was not real friendly. Um, Again, our planes were um, non-pressurized, so we weren't supposed to fly more than 10,000 feet. Well, I paid close attention. It was my very first flight. Even though I had about 25 missions out of Saigon, my first mission out of NKP into Laos, um, I had an instructor who basically was sleeping. He just had to come on board with me. So we're, uh, we're up in the air. Now, oh, before we went up in the air, I paid attention to the briefings. And one was a weather briefing. And then we went to terrain and munitions briefing, what's on the ground. And they said, now, I realize, you know, it's, it's a non-pressurized plane, but the mountains are 11, 11, 5, so you're going to have to fly at least 11, 5 to 12,000 feet in this, you know, during your mission. Because this flat land is the plane of jars, the PDJ, which is a stronghold of the communists, and they had very big guns. So I was part way into the mission, and I'm um, doing what I'm supposed to do, and then I happened to look out my, I had a window right by my seat, and I look out my window, and I don't see any mountains. All I see is flat land. And I woke up my instructor, and I said, you come here. You tell me if you think we are where I think we are. And he looks out the window, and he turns to the navigator, who I believe was a major, if recollection serves me, and he said, sir, do you have any idea where that <coughs> And the navigator said, no, he said, well, you better look. <laughs> the next thing you hear is the navigator saying, oh, shit, and, get, and giving a heading to the, uh, to the pilot to get out of there quickly. And I don't, not that they have governors on those planes, but if there was, they would have broken the governor on a plane. <laughs> we got out of there quickly. But this is a, a Goonie in flight, and with the AJ tail number, that would be a plane out of Saigon. I don't know who took it, but that's a plane out of Saigon. AJ was Saigon, AN was Da Nang, and I can't remember what NKP was. But that, that, that told you what, what um, area it was from. Not a great picture, but that's the cockpit of the Goonie. Um, to, uh, pilot and co-pilot sitting up front. What was fun was on the way back from a mission, never on the way to, but on the way back from a mission, especially if I was off target and we knew that I wasn't going to have any more voice, the pilot would occasionally say, would anybody like stick time? And I would say, me. So I'd get up front and uh, they'd give me the controls and uh, uh, it was fun. We would, uh, I would get the heading from the navigator, I would pilot the plane. And there's no, I don't know how many of you are pilots if you've ever been up front. But there's no greater feeling than to be sitting there with nothing but sky in front of you. I mean, it was beautiful. And then you get the heading from the navigator. I learned a few things. The uh, car, I'm sitting up front with the co-pilot. The pilot was taking a break. And he says, do you, do you know what the trim is? I sure, it's this little wheel. So he would roll the trim forward, and we started going into a dive. And, um, our, there I am. That's by the back door. I don't know if you can see me, but there I am sitting, standing by the back door either before or after a mission, I'm not sure. But that's, we were still in the air. This is my good friend Stan, who um, passed away a couple of years ago. And um, uh, when he got out of the service, he became one of New York's finest, eventually becoming a detective, I think second grade. Uh, I'm not sure, he was one of the higher detectives, whatever it is in New York City. Um, but here he is sitting and working the position. So we had a typewriter right in front of us, as well as um, the mechanism. And the next slide, this is the radios. Now, I'm assuming that because this is now 40 years later, hopefully it's all declassified, otherwise I'm going to be... Um, we worked with all top secret um, crypto information, we, you know, with the code words. Uh, top secret Umbra, secret spoke, all the top secret stuff. And if they haven't changed the code words in all these years, they're in deep doo-doo. Um, but basically, we would spin the dial, 
and we were looking for uh, frequencies on the higher frequency. I had uh, one sergeant who was, a, I, will, I will be polite, he was a career. I won't call him, but he was a career. Um, and he said, well, it was, well, it was never named. I was Z1. The, the linguist was always Z1. Um, uh, I have a voice target at such and such a frequency. And just when he told me the frequency, I knew it was too low to be a target. So I spun to the frequency. This is the configuration of the plane. Now, let me go over here a little bit. If you can see, Z1 is where I sat. It was on the right side, right over the window. Um, behind, right behind me was Y, and then the one in the far back was Z2. Y and Z2, as, as well as X on the left, were all Morse people. <clears throat> um, y and Z2 were intercepting Morse communications on the ground. X was the one that was responsible for getting the fix. I was the one, uh, Z1, who was looking for voice, voice communications. Um, our primary function, besides intercepting, was to get a location of where they were on the ground. Now, the Morse people, the, 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 I'm assuming they were Viet Cong or North Vietnamese transmitting on the ground, had very light mobile um, equipment because they were always on the move. They were always in a different location. My voice targets uh, pretty much were stationary. I think I'm guessing that their equipment was very big, very heavy, and wasn't easily moved together to get the coordinates of where the position was on the ground. While they're doing that, I am listening and I am recording what's being said. Now, what's interesting, and if I had flown out of Okinawa, I would have been tr uh, uh, transcribing actual messages, Vietnamese words, military terms, because that's what my friends over there did. In Vietnam, everything was in code. They were speaking in code. It was either four-digit code or five-digit code. If it was a five-digit code, it was pretty much just chatter, you know, send me some rice or something like that. If it was four-digit code, it was hot stuff. So we would record as long as we were on target until they got the location, and then we would move on. Their, their biggest concern was where is he and uh, is he moving? So the, the code words, and I don't know if it was always the same people, but was Bin Long and Zadink. So we would always hear Bin Long calling Zadink. Um, so we did that. Um, it, was, it was interesting. I'm going to go into something else with that. Um, I just lost it. When I was in, in Thailand on my third mission, I had a pilot that thought he was still flying jets, and he came in when we were returning to base. He zipped down real quick, because we're talking about a twin engine propeller flight, to, to kind of strafe over, not shoot, but uh, buzz some water buffalo. Well, he came down so fast, my ears blocked up, and I couldn't clear him. So, uh, no, no matter how they tried, they sent me down to Utapau, see a specialist, nothing. So I wound up working in ops and talking about the codes. So while I was there, they, um, they gave me books to deco or gave me uh, transcriptions. Um, I wasn't the greatest translator, but I was a whiz at decoding. So we had probably five different decode books. And I would get the transcription in front of me. I would look for the common denominator, what I knew would be, would translate to Vietnamese words. And I would decode the message and then hand it to the guy next to me who was a whiz at translating, and he would get a translator in no time. So we, the two of us worked together real well, because he wasn't that good at decoding. Um, so that was my part of my experience in, in, uh, in Thailand. This is a sunrise over Cambodia. We had a lot of early morning flights, and if we had a if we had a flight out of Saigon, if it was a, well, I guess we started flying as early as five o'clock. So if we had a flight five o'clock mission, um, we were up by three for our first briefing at 3.30 at 7th Air Force headquarters, which is where our headquarters was. And then we went to the flight line for uh, another briefing, for again, for weather and munitions, and to find out our, well, we knew our target area before we left 7th Air Force. So this was over, sunrise over uh, Cambodia. 
This is um, also Cambodia. This is I have a couple of them. This is from Kampong Sam. This one is as well. So like I said, we did a lot. We also flew over. I don't think I have any pictures of it. This is Phnom Penh. This is a um, soccer stadium that supposedly was also used to house uh, uh, munitions during the war. And this is a radio tower in Phnom Penh. This, I believe, is down in the Delta. They're interesting from the air. The designs, I it, it was, uh, it was like art. This was the view I saw most often. <laughs> That's looking out my window to my wing and my antenna. When I first got to Vietnam, it was interesting. When I first got to Vietnam, they were short staffed. I was an E3. And technically, to do what I did, you were supposed to be E4. But because they needed bodies, we started flying immediately. And as soon as I got back from Cameron after my EEG, I was up in the air and we were flying every day. We would fly 12. Now, also, you were supposed to fly five days on, preferably two days off, but at least one day off. We were flying 10 to 12 days on and then a day off. If there was a linguist on board, it was a five hour mission. If they had other planes that did not have the uh, Z1 position, and it was all Morse intercept operators, those were seven hour missions. But our missions were five hours. And um, uh, so when we first got there, we were flying every day. And I mean every day. Um, no breaks at all. After a while, um, they wanted us to study a course, um, the COCDC, and I don't remember what it stood for, um, to be promoted to E4, to be sergeants. Now we had already been doing this probably six months, and I've got a big mouth, and I would say, why? We've, we've been doing the job, you've, been, you've had us doing the job for the last six months, why do we have to now study to be promoted? Because you have to. So we, and this is again where the worms come into play. They um, wanted us all to study, and they would bring us down, and uh, explained it all to us, and there were like 20 or so, or however many linguists we had, and initially, everybody refused. We're gonna study, we've been doing the job, give us the promotion, we're due the promotion, we deserve the promotion, we're not studying. They started breaking everybody by uh, taking away the town pass. So this would have been in March, yeah, I was already back from R&R. &R. So, so it was in March of 771, they took away the town pass. So either you study or you lost your town pass. I said, eh, I don't need my town pass. So there were five of us that we would sit there in a room, we had the book in front of us, and we flat out refused. So to penalize us, they took us off. Now we already had our hours in for the quarter. They took us off flying status, and we had to sit in the room five days a week, eight hours a day, which means that I mean, we're in the air and nobody could possibly shoot us. So, okay, this is good. Uh, yeah, um, we did that for about a month, and finally they saw that this wasn't working, so they put us back on flying steps. Never got our town passes back, but the, there were five of us, and we really didn't care. Um, it, it, and all we were asking for was, and it was very basic. I said, we, with all the training and everything that we did, we should have gotten our second, our third stripe after our second tech school. The ultimate results of all this was after we complained and after we went through all this, those that followed us coming out of tech school after the radio school in San Angelo, Texas, got their third stripe upon graduation there. So we, it worked. We, we benefited others. What we did helped others, which is what was important to us. Would have been nice if it helped us too, because I could have used the extra money. But uh, this was just out the back door. This was a plane we were escorting for a short distance. There was actually another one with him. Um, he lost his right engine. You can see that it's stationary. Um, so uh, we just made sure that he was okay until other planes came in to escort him, which they did. And we just kept with him for a, for a little while. This is Tainan Mountain. Um, a lot of battles were fought uh, taking and retaking this mountain. Um, I believe it was also called Black Virgin Mountain. This is a harbor in, um, in Saigon. And 
this is just a, a rocket attack. Uh, I'm not sure where it's probably, I'm guessing in Cambodia. And this is pockmarks from 52 strikes. You can see all the. It was pretty devastating. When we, when if we were up in the air and there was going to be a 52 strike, it was called an arc light strike, and we had a 25 mile standoff range. Um, so we had to be quite a bit of distance away. But again, looking out the back door, if I wasn't on uh, on a target, um, you could see if you couldn't see the bombs going down. You could certainly see them when they hit the ground. That was the other thing I didn't like about night mission. Talking about bombs, this wasn't bombs, but it was tracers. Now tracers is what one every hundred, one every ten. I'm not sure, but it was just, just like it's a stream of red. I mean, this also Cambodia. This was a Chuk rubber plantation, Michelin tires. This is where they're grown, or at least they were then. I'm not sure about that. Did fly over. I think the next door are the same. I think in the same configuration. This is the um, a star base, and it's uh, like a special forces camp, I believe. And they're out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, this way, if the troops on the ground uh, need san uh, sanctuary, they can get to these star bases. I guess they were pretty well sort, pretty well fortified. After a mission, here I am, cool. My flight suit unzipped because it was hot. <laughs> they, they wonder why. You know, people in the military have health problems. They make the cigarettes so cheap, and they make the liquor so cheap that um, you know everybody was drunk. You know, if you weren't working, people were getting drunk. I mean, here we are playing war. Every so often, they would have uh, an alert drill, and this was uh, right in front of our barracks, the 6994th Security Squadron. <clears throat> Me with some of my. But with this story was that they would have these drills. Supposedly, you know, to simulate Viet Cong storming the base. Oh, and when we flew, I should mention this, when we flew, you know, some people know the Goonie Birds as Puff the Magic Dragon or Spooky with the gunships. We were each issued a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. That's it. And um, uh, so if we ever got into a firefight, we were in deep trouble. I did receive the air medal. They always said, well, if you fly enough, you're going to get the the DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross. Of course, they kept changing the numbers. Initially, if you had like 75 flights, you'd get the DFC, and then if you got 100, you'd get the DFC. Um, I wound up with, I think, 101 missions. So not that the DFC or anything else was important to me, but uh, to some of the guys it was. For anybody serving over there, they know what this is. This is a freedom bird. Uh, this one's coming in to drop people off, unfortunately, but that means it's also going to pick people up. After I came back from Vietnam, I still had time in service. And initially, they were going to send us back to Okinawa for 18 months. And I said, nah, I don't think so, if they followed their rules. So I went and talked to the first sergeant, and I said, I don't think so. Then I'm going to go back to the States to an assignment there. He said, well, you know, this is what it is. I said, OK, I'll see. I'll ask, I'll write to Senator Ribicoff and see what he thinks about all this. So I got assigned to the National Security Agency. Once they gave me my assignment and I got mine changed, I went back to the barracks and said, hey guys, they just set a precedent. So if you don't want to stay here and extend, and if you don't want to go back to Okinawa, go down to headquarters and tell them you want to go to NSA. Because if they say no, just say, invoke your senator's name and you'll get it. So one by one, all of them did, and uh, one guy, my friend Stan, actually extended in Vietnam for six months, but the rest of them all went down. We all wound up in NSA. While we were at National Security Agency, initially we had medial jobs. We were on the fifth and seventh floor. The fun part of the NSA, to me anyway, was that I was an E3. I was about the lowest ranking person you could have. But I could go on floors that colonels couldn't go to. We'd get on the elevator, and majors and uh, lieutenant colonels and full colonels would have to get off at the third floor, and I'm continuing up to the fifth and seventh floor because they can't go there because they didn't have the clearance or the need to know. Initially, it was menial work. It was uh, just taking things off of uh, ticker tapes, um, um, DDP, and there were messages, and we would send them by pneumatic tube to other sections. Um, my friend Bill and I used to work quite often on Sundays we meet at the entrance to NSA, and we would buy a, a Washington Post, and we would share it. I would take part of it, and he would take part of it. And we, he would be on one floor, I'd be on the other. And as we finished our section, we would roll it up, 
put it in the pneumatic tube and send it down to the other. <laughs> and send one up to me. But we also did our job. We were taking things off and still sending those to the, the proper departments. After a few months of doing that, they gave us real jobs. Most of the guys were put in these little cubicles, which they called shops. I'm not sure why, but they called them shops. But they were a cubicle about four by four, or something like that. And they would take information from the previous day uh, that came in off of some transcribed tapes, write up a snippet of information, and um, eventually made it back to me. Now I was, I had to be there like everybody else at 8:30 in the morning. I drank a lot of coffee because my day didn't really start till about three in the afternoon. At which point I had to get everything done before I left for the day, which was usually about five five thirty. So little snippets of information that I would get from all of these different cubicles, some on transports from the day before from Vietnam, on shoot downs from the day before, uh, Navy intelligence from the day before, and it all came to me. And it was my job to write one cohesive report that I was told. Never found out if it was true. That went to the Joint Chiefs and to the White House. Richard Nixon was president at the time. So I would write this one cohesive report from these little bits of information. And you had to keep at it. Now, this is before computers, so you had to wait till you had everything to try to put it in some semblance of order. So even though someone might hand me something at 2 in the afternoon or even at noontime, I had to wait till I had everything to put it in some kind of a sequence so that when I wrote it, it made sense. Fortunately, I was a pretty good typist, so that wasn't too bad, but it was still getting it all together. And then I had to edit what I had. The other problem I had was editorializing. I sometimes invoked my personal f feelings about what was happening over there. One report was, was about a plane bombing in Hanoi, and, um, and I remember um, saying that, however, unlike on previous occasions, no schools or hospitals were destroyed, uh, or innocent women and children killed. So I had to retype that one. Um, they would come in. I was all the way back in the corner. I mean, way back at the front. I couldn't even see the front door. But when they wanted me, I could hear them yell, where's Goldstein? So I knew I was in trouble. Um, and I had a, there was a, another one, um, was the second time, and the final time, was when it was um, the, uh, December 31st, when I typed up a report where a Navy plane was shot down over Hanoi. Pilot and navigator were captured alive, and uh, this was part of my report. And I did wish them a merry, a belated Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I had to retype that one. I'm surprised they kept me. But I, I was privy to a lot of classified information, things that was interesting, especially being at NSA. The war that I was seeing and the war that I was writing about was not the war in the newspapers or on television. There were two different wars. You know, the, the body counts and all that, so inflated. You know, it was you know, as far as on their side and our side was diminished, on, according to the news. I decided to go into Georgetown. Near my end, again, as I said earlier, I was opposed to the war. And I went to a meeting and to see what the Vietnam Veterans Against the War was all about. And thought it interesting. So I thought that, well, once I get out, I might get involved once I go back to New Haven. Once I got back to New Haven and I went to the VVAW office on Wall Street in New Haven, um, I was greeted by someone, a little older, but um, actually was a Korea veteran, but he was there at the VVAW office, and we became fast friends immediately, and uh, he went with me. I wasn't a believer in, in standing in the middle of church, if you know, the Haven Church and Chapel on a Thursday and blocking traffic. I thought that was pretty dumb. But I would go to schools, I would go to churches, uh, town greens, college campuses, and talk about my experiences and show them some pictures of what I had. Little did I know that the person who befriended me was an FBI agent that was assigned to me. I made his job very easy and walked in and introduced myself to him. <laughs> We're still good friends. And it took, I guess it was about three or four years later um, that I found out, might have been that long, that I found out who we, who, what he did and that I was his target. Um, but we never talked about it. He was also a musician. He used to play in one of the clubs in New Haven. And we played this little game of cat and mouse. So my wife and I we were just dating at the time, I believe. And we would, on a Saturday night, go in late at night, like around 11 o'clock. Because um, we didn't have a lot of money, so we'd go in for a beer, or maybe two beers, where he was playing. Where he was 
sitting at the piano, he could see anybody that walked in. And no matter what song he was playing, when when we walked in, to, in the door, he'd look at us, and he would break into the theme from the FBI. Remember the old television show? <laughs> A few years after that, that we finally talked about it. Earlier about the, uh, the two pilots, or pilot and navigator, and the Navy plane that went down. Uh, this was would have been December of 1971, December 31st, 1971 is when I wrote about it. I guess it happened actually on December 30th. Fast forward to I guess 2000. I started thinking, whatever happened to these two guys? You know, I, I made a light of it at the time, but now I was concerned. Did they ever make it back? Did, you know, what's the story with them? Are they are they safe? Did they survive? So I contacted the MIA POW people. I gave them the approximate dates of when the shootdown was. And I couldn't remember their names, but I remember that one of them being kind of a high-ranking Navy officer, which was unusual for these missions because it was a flight over, over Hanoi. And, um, and one of them had what I believed to be a Hispanic name. And that was the only things I had to go by. Well, I heard back from the MIA POW people and told me, well, no, you're mistaken because it was a ceasefire and we had no planes going over North Vietnam at that time. I said, that's crap. I wrote the article. I wrote the report. I know they did. So I wrote to Senator McCain. He was a guest, if you would call it that, of the Hanoi Hilton when they were shot down. So I thought maybe he might have some recollection as to these guys or what happened to them or if he even knew who they were. This is a letter. Dear Mr. Goldstein, thank you for your inquiry regarding the potential unreported loss of several aviators over Hanoi during the Vietnam War. During the Vietnam War. Please forgive my long delayed response. Now, I probably wrote to him in March of 2000. That's when he was running against George W. Bush for president uh, for the nomination for the Republican Party. So, yeah, he was busy. Um, I am always glad to have the opportunity to be of, of assistance. I have contacted the Department of Defense about this matter on your behalf. I have asked for a prompt response to be sent directly to you. Please do not hesitate to contact me uh, if you have any further questions or comments. This is dated January 8th. On January 24th, I received a letter from the Department of Defense. Okay, this response to your letter to Senator McCain regarding unaccounted for servicemen from the Vietnam War. Uh, while serving in the Air Force in the early 70s, you recall typing a report that two Navy aviators were shot down over North Vietnam and captured in 1971 between Christmas and the end of the year. You would like to know what happened to the men? Senator McCain, McCain forwarded your letter to our office because we are a Department of Defense agency responsible for accounting for American personnel missing from our nation's wars, and we are pleased to provide you the following information. Navy Lieutenant Commander David W. Hoffman and Lieutenant Junior Grade Norris A. Alfonso were lost on December 30, 1971 when their F-4 aircraft was shot down during a combat mission over North Vietnam. And that was them. And I remembered that. As soon as I read their names, I said, this is them. After successfully ejecting from their stricken aircraft, the two men were captured and imprisoned in the North Vietnamese prison system. I am pleased to inform you both men survived captivity Lieutenant Alfonso was repatriated in 1972, and Commander Hoffman was repatriated in 1973. And this was interesting. The information you were provided by POW MIA activists' website that no American aviators were captured or lost between December 18, 1971 and January 8, 1972 is incorrect. In addition to Commander Hoffman and Lieutenant Alfonso, 19 American aviators were lost over North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia during that time frame. Please note that this number does not include uh, cases where an American was lost and immediately recovered. I got closure. Uh, the letter goes on. It's a two-page letter. It was interesting times. I'm glad they're behind me. Yeah? Did any of those messages or intelligence you gathered, did it result in an attacks on these areas? I know the guys on Combat Apple out of Kadena, <clears throat> they were right in the moment. It's a mission where they tried to re rescue Senator McCain. They knew there was a mission going in, but they also had a source on the ground where they knew that the mission was going to be a bust. It was not going to be successful because McCain and the others were not at that prison when they were going in. But they couldn't abort the mission because by doing that, it would have tipped off that there was someone on the ground with information. So 
they went in and it was a, and it was a failure. And a lot of times the um, uh, Army pilots and Army personnel and everybody at Marines used to you know blame the Air Force for poor intelligence. And he says it wasn't poor intelligence. He says we just couldn't tell them that you had a, you know somebody on the ground with you know with the, with the proper information because we would have blown his cover or her cover probably him for future ventures. So he, their hands were tied. But they were more, the Combat Apple um, was more in the moment. We were, I don't know, I, I can't honestly answer that as far as anything. Now the Morse operators, because it was in Morse, I think they were able to transcribe and do everything pretty quickly and they would get their answers. Um, when I got back to Ops after a mission, I would turn my tapes in to the uh, to headquarters, uh, seventh, well, it was our headquarters, which was in the 7th Air Force compound. Um, and I don't know whether, I think they transcribed them there, but they still had to be decoded, and I don't know whether they we were We had troops on the ground in Cambodia, although yeah. most Americans don't know that. Yeah. Um, I have a good friend of mine from my photography world days, I found out afterwards that he was in the Army, and he was part of a group that was in Laos on the ground, and he was told, point blank, that if you get captured, we don't, they, he was not allowed to get any identification whatsoever, and if you get captured, we don't know you. Well, I flew over both, yeah. um, but according to our government, we weren't there. Thank you. Uh, give us a rough number, 50, 100. Uh, how many sorties did you do? I did, I believe it was 101. I had over 500 hours in the back end of a Gleebird. Would you have the same air crew several times? No, the back end always changed. We may have had the same ones occasionally, but it wasn't a regular basis. It wasn't a set crew. So before you go on a sortie, do you have a meeting the day before, the night before? This is where we're going to go. This the, is what we're going to do. The morning of. Letter in the mail one day from my mother, <laughs> and it's a map that she cut out of the Hartford Current of Southeast Asia. Now I'm not telling her what I'm exactly what I'm doing or where I'm flying, but she says, "Are any of these areas where you fly?" And she circles. <laughs> All of our frag areas. I said, holy crap. She was right on the money. She, I mean, she followed that war very, very closely. She was, anytime, anything that came out of Vietnam, I mean, I'm at Tan which is technically in Saigon, but if there was any kind of a bombing or something in Saigon, she would contact me in some way or write me a letter. Were you there? Everything was Dateline Saigon. You know, no, I wasn't anywhere. I never knew about it. Next question. Was there ever a flight you got back and you said to yourself, I owe that pilot a beer? Did that ever happen? Now most of them, fortunately, oh, oh that night you should, um, but um, most of the, oh, you have another story. Um, <laughs> most of the missions were, were fairly routine. Um, the pilots were good, the, the planes were good. Um, sometimes on the way back, I would go, I would sleep. And, um, I'm asleep one day, we're coming back, we're heading back to Tatsunyu, and I hear rain, 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 anybody familiar with that? It means prepare to bail out. <laughs> and I look up, and everybody, including the co-pilot, is hooked up to the static line. I go, oh, shh. <laughs> they were having a little joke on Harvey. The briefings, after the briefing at the 94th, we went to the flight line, and we had two briefings there. One was on weather, what kind of, was it going to be rainy, cloudy, sunny, whatever it was going to be. And that was followed by the terrain and what kind of guns they, they think are on the ground below us. So I mean this with peace and love. After years of reflection on your service time, is it something that you were happy you did? Honestly? Huh? No. No. I, I, um, um, if I had had the courage of my convictions, I might have gone to jail, I might have gone to Canada. Um, I was not a fan, I thought that the war was, was not right in the first place. I felt it was an immoral war then, and that never changed. I did a lot of reading about the starting of the war, why it happened and everything before I ever went in. So it wasn't like I was half cocked and I was going along with a lot of protesters. Yeah. I knew the history of Vietnam, or I knew a lot of it. World War II was a just war. There was, there was a reason for World War II. Um, but Korea or Vietnam or some of the other things that were going on now, 
they're political. They're political mainly on the American side, you know, for whatever gain, whether it be for oil or for profit. Um, so now I have, uh, but what has come out of it for me is, um, and Jim is here, um, I did not get involved with any veterans organizations. I didn't join the VFW, I didn't join the American Legion. <laughs> You mentioned before that your flight pay was $65 a month. Right. I was in the Navy in 64, uh, flight crew, as a rescue air crewman in helicopters, and we got $75 a month back then. What was your rank? E3. Oh. Well, the 65 was on top of your pay. Right. On top of the pay, yeah. Well, we, I, I, I wondered, did that ever go up for you? Not bad. I got, um, I got my regular pay, which whatever was two hundred and forty dollars a month. I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't. I don't remember <laughs> what the regular pay was. But I got sixty-five dollars for um, overseas pay or, or Vietnam pay, and sixty-five dollars for combat pay, which yeah. is a flight pay or combat flight pay. So it was. It was. A, I received an extra one hundred and thirty dollars above my regular. Right. Pay. Right. That's about what we got for the uh, sea pay and uh, for the flight pay, overseas. You know. Stuff like that. But I was curious that just it never went up, huh? And you Not got a, what year did you get out? Well, I was in Vietnam seventy seventy one. I came back to the States in July of seventy one and I got out of the service in April of seventy two. Seventy two. Yeah. I finished like I said, I finished up at the uh, NSA. Right. Yeah. Real quick, um, you were talking about the MiG five pilots. I was in Vietnam in sixty nine here in the DNC. I heard, we heard rumors there was Russian and Chinese pilots. Yeah, I did. Did you have well, translators for Russia? And, and on, on Combat Apple, uh, out, of, out of Pegida, we had Russian linguists, Chinese linguists, North Korean linguists, and North Vietnamese linguists. Yeah. So that's, they all, they were all on that. Like I said, it was a 24 hour mission and they just took turns sitting in positions. Mm -hmm. I never got onto that plane. Uh, so I don't know exactly how it worked. I knew that it, I've heard from others that uh, my friends that were there that it was kind of grueling, but it was it felt safer at 35,000 feet than I did at 8,000. Yeah, I was where we were training pilots, <coughs> and we had some Vietnamese there. And one of them asked somebody asked him, one of them, he said, "Who are you going to fly for when you go back?" He says, "Whoever pays me the best." <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.